Hey everybody, I'm Asian Funk. Welcome back to my channel. Today we have a very special guest and he is back again. Uh, he is a novelist, journalist, and the creator of Squirrel Girl, uh, Will Murray. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you, Mark. I enjoyed the last time. I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it this time. Oh, well, lower your expectations. Uh, well, I, I think we'll have a good time. <laughs> Um, okay, so I want to, I just want to say, you know, first off, I'm a huge fan, and I'm really glad to have you back again. And like you, I had a blast speaking with you, I felt like it wasn't enough time. And um, I wanted to get to some of the things we didn't get to cover last time. Um, but I want to let you know, just how our last interview went, you were here a little over a year ago. Um, you were one of my first big interview um, personalities. And it is now the most viewed interview on my channel. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. Now you're telling me a year later. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to save that news for you. Well, um, that's nice to hear. Every time I've asked another person to be on my channel, um, th these are people I've never met, never spoke to. I don't have a history with them. Um, I would ask them, hey, do you want to be on my channel? And then they would say, oh, I've watched one of your videos. And I would be like, oh, which one? And they would say the squirrel girl one. No kidding. That's for some reason, that is the video that people keep pointing out that they've seen on my channel. Like they, they've never heard of me before, but that's the video that they've seen. Where are my residuals? <laughs> would not have expected that to be honest with you. Same so. here. Since that video aired, um, a gentleman by the name of Mark S. Ditko commented. Uh, yeah on the yeah. video saying that he really enjoyed the interview. And I was like, who is this guy, right? Because Ditko is a pretty unique last name. Right, no, I, I know who Mark is. His, his, his nickname is Zen. I don't know him personally, but we're Facebook friends. He's, uh, I, I think, a nephew of Steve Ditko's. Correct, I did not know that until I looked it up. I was like, oh, this is a real person. And not only is he a real person, he's related to Steve Ditko. Steve Dit that's right. And um, so because of that video interview we had, um, I'm going to have him on the channel. Oh, that's month. great. So that's great. So I, I want to ask you, is there anything you would like me to ask him or anything that you would like to know? Well, I knew Steve and we had lots of conversations. So um, I, I think, you know, Mark could tell about the more personal Steve Ditko, the private man in terms of, you know, what he was like as a as a member of an extended family named Ditko. I know that Steve on holidays like Thanksgiving used to go down to uh, Pennsylvania where he grew up and, you know, have Thanksgiving dinner and be part of, you know, the, an extended family. So, you know, I know, I knew Steve from visiting a studio, working with him and talking with the phone for, for many years. And it would be, so I know him in the, that context, uh, a professional but friendly context, it would be interesting to know what he was like, you know, in, in more relaxed family. Uh, right. Like so. as a, as a person, right. Not as a, a working colleague. Yeah. Not as a working person, not as a creator, but as just as a, one of the members of the family that gathers at Thanksgiving. He was a great thinker. And he's, I still say he's one of the most brilliant guys in comics in the context of he brought true intellect to comics, a true creative intellect and gave a lot of thought to what he did and didn't just say, okay, they want me to create a new character. I'll throw something together. Oh, that looked good. Let's go. Uh, he cared about what he did. And, you know, he, I remember him telling me that, you know, sometimes they would, he would design a character and come up with a color scheme and they change it. And he wouldn't necessarily approve the changes uh, like the creeper. He showed me a sketch of the creeper mm -hmm. with a completely yep. different color scheme. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think he had a good color sense. He didn't like the original Spider-Man coloring because he wanted the character to be a cool blue versus a, uh, a warm orange red. And uh, because the Fantastic Four was in the first issue of Spider-Man and they wore cool blue uniforms, uh. Marvel had felt it necessary to recolor Spider-Man so he was red and purplish. And he hated that because that wasn't the vision he had. I, I actually thought it was an interesting color scheme and they got rid of it after a while. Uh, but you know, when you had in Marvel, when you had crossover characters, you have coloring issues that had to be yeah. solved intelligently. And you didn't always have all the latitude in the world to say, well, you know, Fantastic Four are cool, but well, Spider-Man has a lot red, 
a lot of red in his uniform. Let's keep him cool blue. No, they made him purplish as well as red. And, you know, Steve cared enough to, to, be, to still remember it to me as one of the things he didn't like. You know. That is interesting. Huh. Do you recall what the last thing you and Steve talked about or one of your last conversations was? I think the last conversation we had was very short. And so I don't think we got into anything specific. But before that, we would talk about, you know, during the whole Revlon, Marvel, Perlman wars, where Marvel was, you know, crashing and burning and they were trying to save it. We talk about that a lot, about, you know, <laughs> yeah. how the industry had changed. I, I, I remember a lot of conflict. He liked to argue. And so you'd set up these arguments. And, you know, one of our big arguments we never resolved is what is a hero? And he, he, he thought a hero should be like Superman, completely pure and without any flaw, which mm -hmm. is unrealistic and only works to us. It works with the Lone Ranger. It wouldn't work with the Shadow. Yeah. And I pointed out that the word hero is Greek and it's, it's, it's named after a character who was, in fact, flawed. And so I said, you know, if we're going back to the origins of the word hero, I mean, it starts with a flawed man who rose to some heroic, or was it a woman, whatever it was. Yeah. So, you know, he didn't budge, I didn't budge, but, you know, but we had good conversations, Yeah. you know, he would tell me stuff. Uh, in later years, he stopped telling people stuff because everybody was asking about. Sure, sure. How yeah. Vitamin was created and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm. Like you said, you know, or in like a lot of people, a lot of fans know he's he was pretty much private. So it's very hard to get a sense of what he was like as a person. There's barely any video interviews of him, like if any. Um, no, he, he did in the 60s a little bit. There are a few fanzine interviews. And he's pretty cut and dried in those interviews. He's pretty black and white about things. If someone asked, you know, what's important uh for an artist in comics to learn he would talk about you know figure drawing how drapery hangs on people's limbs and stuff and you know he he, he was very dedicated but at the same time he was he never operated in a fan love mm -hmm. he didn't understand the fans you know he, he i had a conversation with him and i don't think i got to make my point as clearly as i could have but he claimed that the fans hated him because he left Sp Marvel and left Spider-Man and Doctor Strange while they were still, you know, hot. And he said his Charlton characters died and most of his DC characters died. You know, they weren't supported. And I pointed out to him that the Charlton superhero line was put to sleep because of, you know, distributor issues. DC or somebody didn't like that superhero line competing with them. So mm. that wasn't the fault of those characters or the fans. Yeah, We all supported those comics. The other thing, and this is the point I wasn't able to make because it didn't occur to me till years after he passed away, is that, you know, a Spider-Man is like capturing lightning in a bottle. You, do, you, you know, if you look at the history of, of comics, what are the big hits? Superman, Batman, Captain Marvel, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, uh, X-Men, Conan, uh and, you know not too many there are not too yeah. many home runs yeah semi-successful ones might like run three four five ten years like on tv even a successful tv show is gone in five years mm -hmm. usually yeah and so you know he blamed the fans when in fact it is very hard to put out a new character a new book that hits a home run simply because all the home run characters are already sucking up all the dollars yeah you know, you're you're competing against things that are you know huge. Yeah. You know, there's no room. Starts, there's no more yeah, room. There's not a well. Yeah. People's budgets are limited. You know, they're going to be selective. If X Men, if the X Men line is five books a month, and most people like X Men, there goes a lot of dollars. You know, never yeah. mind the back issues, which are sucking up more money. Yeah. You know? Hmm. Interesting. Well, okay. So <laughs> you mentioned something about you know. Um, that there was an interest in like, you know, what it means to be a hero and everything. And so do you consider Squirrel Girl a hero? Oh, absolutely. And here's funny, Steve wouldn't draw her after the first story, which I wasn't <laughs> able to communicate because he didn't think she was a serious character. I wasn't able to communicate to him, and I wish I had tried harder, that she's an upbeat, positive character. She's exactly the type of character he thought comic characters should be. Mm. Basically, there's not a bad bone in her body. You know, 
she's part Peter Pan, part girl, part squirrel, and you know, and so maybe some other things. Uh, and if he if he'd understood that she was that way, he would he might have been tempted to draw her again. Maybe not because he was pretty much done with Marvel at a certain point. Yeah, I think the Iron Man story he did with me was one of the last long stories he did for Marvel. After that, it was just a couple of short Iron Man things and a few things here and there, yeah. and things that might not have been published, right? You know, that I don't know about. Um, so, um, what was the question again? I had lost. Oh that. no, no. So I just wanted to uh, pivot into Squirrel Girl because so the main reason why I have you on here, and uh, I really enjoyed um, your response when I told you this, but uh, so. Squirrel Girl was, uh, she made her first appearance in Marvel Superheroes Winter Special number eight uh, in winter of 1991. Yeah, late uh, 91. Yeah. That's right. Which means that this winter of this year, it will be her 30th anniversary. 30, and, yeah, I didn't realize it was 30th anniversary of being published, but I wrote the story in November 89. So her, her creation was, is actually mm. uh, 32 years. Ah, so she's older. She's older She's than actually <laughs> older. You know, the original artist I probably mentioned this was going to be Tom Morgan, and he oh, accepted right. the assignment. But uh, and I didn't know this for the longest time. But uh, he was in the office picking up the script when Steve Ditko walked in looking for work. And Tom DeFalco had told all the editors, if Steve Ditko shows up looking for work, give him what you can, because at that time Steve, you know, was looking a little ragged. His shoes were kind of falling apart. And, hmm. You know. It's the, held together with tape and stuff so people were concerned about him so when steve came in looking for work my editor howard mackey told me that story uh, at a convention a couple of years ago handed steve the iron man script which delighted me but i'm sure it disappointed tom morgan because that was his next job yeah did tom did tom actually did he already Sketch no, her out, no, draw her out. No, okay. I don't think he'd read the script. I think the script was about to be handed to him, you know. Mm. And so he, you know, he if he'd have, if he had been the artist and he'd followed my instructions, Squirrel Girl would have been dressed in a Peter Pan kind of costume, uh, because I based her partly on Peter Mary Martin's Peter Pan, uh, visually to some degree. Uh, so you know, as a as a character who hopped off with squirrels, she'd be in the forest a lot. So green forest outfit, maybe. right? Robin, yeah, makes sense. Blended Peter, with your background, you know, yeah. Uh, I I think Steve Steve told me that you know when he and I had no objection to him changing the 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 look of the character. He said a character should look like their name or should look like their concept. So if she's squirrel girl, she should be dressed in squirrel Attires. colors and squirrel, yeah. squirrel fur. Now I. I I have a problem with that part of it since she's wearing fur. Is she is she wearing roadkill? So you know, and her costume looks really makeshift. Her original costume, mm -hmm. you know, it was yeah. you know again it looked like something she's flung together, you know, out of odds and ends. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to ask if you were if you were asked to write a one off story for Squirrel Girl's thirtieth or 32nd anniversary, what what do you think that story might be like? I would have to really think about it. I mean, I had, a, I, I pitched the plot a long time. I pitched a couple plots over the years when, first when I was trying to keep her alive and Marvel wasn't having anything to do with her. <laughs> and later when she was revived, but I, I wanted her to try to join the Fantastic Four, uh, mm -hmm. just like she tried to hook up with Iron Man. And just like Spider-Man tried to, to hook up to join the Fantastic, the Fantastic Four in the beginning, I thought that might make an interesting story because the premise is she'd come in and be laughed at and she'd save the day somehow. Right, right. Hmm. Another idea I had uh, was that she would uh, tangle with Dr. Doom again and Dr. Doom would figure out her worst fear. And her oh. worst fear is, is that she had nightmares of Tyrannosaurus Rex because she's That's a rodent. <laughs> Okay, and uh, and he would send her back to the time of Tyrannosaurus Rex, mm. thinking that's the end of Squirrel Girl, and she comes back in a barbaric costume, looking for blood. She's conquered Tyrannosaurus Rex, and she's conquered her only fear in life, and she would become kind of dark Squirrel Girl, suicide. Ooh, squirrel. I I like that. There's a savage Squirrel Girl, right? That would be something. Yeah, savage Squirrel Girl. You know, 
This is a cosplayer by the name of Ricky Riddle. And she is like one of, she's a pretty famous cosplayer. Um, okay. And she did a Squirrel Girl cosplay that was so good that it landed her on the cover of a comic book cover. It's a wonderful costume. It's, it departs from the original, but I like the gray. I like the suede boots. They seem to be sway, suede. There's just a little hint of brown. I mean, it's a nice design. It's an extremely good design. It's a more mature Squirrel Girl than, you know, has yet to appear, I think. This is more Squirrel Girl in her later 20s. Uh, but I think it's, it's very sharp. I like the design. I like the look. There are all sorts of Squirrel Girls out there between cosplay and actresses who either said, I'd like to play the character or ones that have been put forward. And, you know, the, the character I created could have turned into any, grown up to be any one of those body types and, you know, looks. So this is as good a squirrel girl as any and better than most. It's just, it's a little bit of a more mature take, which I like because squirrel girl can't be frozen in time. Yeah. Although if I had written her more adventures, I would have kept her at 15. I, I, I thought her charm was the fact that she was, you know, more or less uh, prepubescent. So she mm -hmm. wouldn't get into the, the emotions and the hormones of, that Marvel Comics characters were getting into at that time and still do. But I, I like this. Yeah. And the hair is a nice color and it looks like she's matched the tail with the hair to some degree. Mm. Uh, so it, it's great. I hope you have her on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, you would like to keep her in her like early, early teens. Um, because... Well, it's too late for that now, but that was my original thought. Sure. Sure. But it's interesting because, you know, people, any actress uh, who has tried to, you know, basically whenever they get asked like, oh, which Marvel character would you love to play? Squirrel Girl comes up, you know, those are always actresses in their, you know, 20s, 30s. But, you know, no one's ever considered having like a younger actress play Squirrel Girl, you know? I think there may have been a thought to it because I have a, uh, uh, a maquette of, of basically baby Squirrel Girl. She's a toddler that someone made. Uh, I forget the name of the company. Uh, if I thought I had thought about it, I'd, I'd show it to you. It's in the next room. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But it's, it's basically, it's a nice little uh, sculpture, but it's basically Squirrel Girl. She looks like she might be three, four, five, something like that. And I don't know why they would have done that unless there was some thought to an mm. animated show or something. And this was a product for something that never happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did someone was thinking of it. Yeah, someone was someone had to be thinking about because why would you DH her to that point? Nobody wants to see baby Spider Man or baby right, Hulk. Because <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want people to be able to follow your work. Where can they find you online? www.adventuresinbronze.com is my website for my books. My books are also on Amazon. I write Doc Savage, The Shadow. I'm on Twitter as Will Murray three three four. Well, I'd love to have you back. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to do it again. We always have a good time. There's always something to talk about, and we always leave a lot out.